The Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Today we're happy to have Wes McKinney. Uh, he's the co-founder and creator of, of Voltron. Um, so the rather than, than me talk about uh, Wes's background, we decided to reach out to an old friend of Wes uh, and have him send a video. So unfortunately, this person can't be here today uh, because of other obligations, but they sent a quick video that's going to describe Wes's background for everyone. What's going on with it? From Carnegie, co-founder of Votran Data. Creator Apache, Arrow Creator Python Pandas, Underground at MIT. That was N64 GoldenEye Speedrum World Record holding in the late 90s. Now that's great shit. That's great shit on hood. I'm happy five you. Enjoy your day. Stern up and many more fight come on hood. And cheers, this cold old English. Right. So. Uh, with that, Wes, go ahead and share your screen, and by all means, get started. And for anybody in the audience, if you have questions for Wes as, as he gives the talk, please feel free to unmute yourself and say who you are and ask your question anytime. All right, Wes, thank you for being here. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Andy, for having me. Um, I, uh, I like giving, you know, giving these uh, yeah, update talks to this technical audience since uh, it's often led to productive, uh, productive collaborations after the fact. Uh, and it is it is true that I did I did spend uh, a major portion of my youth uh, doing uh, Golden I 007 speed runs uh, in the late '90s, but uh, yeah, it's a long long time ago now. Uh, it does come up does come up now and then. Crit 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 Mac was very impressed by that. You're, you're a good friend. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, we're coming right up on uh, six years of. Um, uh, of Apache Era development, I assume that almost everyone on the call, uh, you know, already knows what this project is. But you know, I'll give a quick quick recap since many people watching the video online maybe won't already be um, won't already be Arrow experts. Um, I was at Cloudera when uh, I helped create the project. There, this was in 2015, and it was clear at that time with the there was the you know there was a confluence of different factors leading to the need to develop uh, a standardized um, in-memory data representation to tie together tie together systems. I was coming at the problem from the Python data science world and, and I had a lot of frustration with like getting access to data so that I can uh, work with it in pandas or use it in use it in Python. And so I landed at landed at Cloudera in 2014 with the mission of like providing a Python programming API for things like Impala and Spark and other big data systems and found myself in this like kind of uh, quagmire of like, how do we even connect these systems together? Like, how do we get data out? How do we run user defined functions without paying a huge penalty? And so at that time, um, and prior to that, there was this feeling of like, oh, well, Python's not a serious language. And so, you know, people are willing to pay a lot of overhead for the convenience of, of using Python. And so if you look at, compare the Hadoop streaming API, you know, you know programming MapReduce jobs in Java versus like you could write MapReduce jobs in Python, but if you cared about saving compute costs, like why would you ever, why would you ever do that? And nobody really cared because they're like, oh, it's Python, it doesn't matter. So it costs a lot, like, you know, it's not a real language, but obviously like, um, as you know, to paraphrase the uh, the dude, um, new stuff has come to light, and um, languages like like Python uh, have become a lot more important. And I think we'll continue to see a lot of programming language diversity. And so, making creating an environment where you can connect together programming languages, data processing engines, database systems, uh, without uh, with minimal overhead is going to be critical to uh, having a, a better, more efficient, uh, more efficient future. Um, we have, we have, uh, uh, founded a company this year called, called Voltron Data. Um, and, you know, we're building, um, aero powered computing systems. So I'll, I'll give a few words, um, about, uh, about, uh, about our company and how, how it came together at the, um, at the end of the talk. 
Um, so, so we've been building this, this project. It started out as a description, a specification for a memory format. Uh, so an in-memory format, and then we developed a protocol for uh, serializing and transmitting that memory format across processes. Um, and you know, over the last several years, essentially, we've created this uh, expansive developer toolbox that solves uh, all, all manner of problems, like first order and second order problems that arise out of building applications that use the, use the Arrow format. So we've taken a really component-based modular approach to building integrations with file formats, uh, serialization tools, compression, memory management, um, file systems, like all, you know, in, any problem that you would bump into when you go to act to build a real system. Um, so rather than, you know, leaving developers to cobble together, like random open source, you know, different open source projects to solve problems, we, we wanted to provide a uh, batteries included development platform to build fast analytic systems. Um, the, the Arab format was designed uh, for uh, for processing efficiency, uh, it wasn't designed as a storage format, um, and uh, it was intended to address the the language interoperability and system connectivity challenges that that we perceived in the 2015 era. And thankfully, um, a lot of people have shown up to say that yeah, we agree that this is you know a problem worth solving, and it's uh, it's really great that we've built a uh, thriving uh, developer community to build one solution, one robust solution to the problem rather than have like, you know, a half dozen, you know, incompatible competing standards to, to, to do the same, uh, to do the same thing. So kind of the way I, the way, one way I think about the project and, and how I describe, uh, describe it to some people is that, you know, we're, we're trying to do for, for data analytics software, what, what LLVM did for, for compiler infrastructure. Um, so rather than having a uh, completely vertically vertically integrated system, we have these modular components that solve uh, that solve different problems up up and down the stack. And so you, as a system builder, uh, can choose which parts of the you know which parts of the system, the platform to use, like which programming language, like which pieces of software. Um, so if you, you want to, to do, you know, embedded query processing in Rust, like we've got a, you know, we've got a thing for that. If you need to, uh, compile, uh, array expressions for projections and filters, like we've got a compiler that you can take and you can, you know, use the compiled expressions in a system that's written in Java, um, you know, in Dremio, you know, arranged, you know, to do that because they needed to accelerate uh, accelerate their, their operators in, in, uh, in Dremio and in, in Java, uh, using LLVM. Um, so you aren't beholden, you know, to, to sort of take on all of the, you know, all of the things that exist in the project. And there are projects that are using Arrow that, that are only using the protocol standards, um, like the, uh, the, the C, the C interface. And so I'll talk a little bit, um, uh, about how that works and how we're seeing, uh, real world, um, uh, database management systems like, like DuckDB. Uh, adopting the C interface so that we can have um, systems that depend on each other and connect together while sharing no code at all, aside from um, simple capsule data structure. So we're, we're aiming towards this world where we can increasingly rely on being able to plug together systems and, and they may not, the systems may not be Arrow native themselves, but uh, you have the option of uh, connecting via, you know, via arrow, whether that's like sending a single chunk of data or sending a stream, a stream of data, either in process, for example, at CFFI boundary, um, or inter process, like through shared memory or sending data through a socket or over, over, uh, something like gRPC. Um, we've been really busy, um, over the, the last five, almost six years. So brief, you know, brief summary of, uh, history of the project. Uh, we announced the project at the beginning of 2016. We started making releases um, at the end of 2016. It took us a while to um, to have a piece of software that we could that we could release. Um, and since then, you know, we've got into a quarterly, roughly quarterly cadence of major releases. We declared Arrow the uh, memory format and binary protocol for interprocess communication stable. Uh, in the middle of 2020. 
So that was, you know, more than four years into the process. Um, and then we also moved to a semantic versioning system uh, for the for the libraries. So now the protocol itself has a separate versioning scheme. So we're still on um, the 1.0 uh, protocol version. Um, so, but the libraries are evolving. Um, are evolving. Uh, the version numbers are going up more quickly. So roughly one major version per uh, per quarter. Um, and so it's a little bit confusing maybe, but the 6.0 version tracks the 1.0 protocol version. And so you can reason about like protocol stability between versions of the libraries to say like, okay, well, if I, if I have the 6.0 version of the C++ library and the 1.0 version of the Java library, you can have a, the confidence that you have uh, backwards and forward compatibility um, at the protocol level. Um, and so the libraries could be different versions and it's no problem. Um, so a little bit, you know, where, where we're at and some of the, the work that's been, uh, that's been going on uh, lately in the project and things that are happening in the, that happened recently in the 6.0 .6 release. Um, there's been a significant amount of uh, labor invested in the C++ and Rust projects uh, to provide um, embeddable uh, query execution components. So data fusion is a, um, uh, is a complete, um, is a complete query execution system in Rust, including a uh, query parser, um, planner, uh, a planner, uh, an execution engine um, in C++. Uh, we've been we've been building uh, modular relational operators for for query processing, uh, but we do not um, we we do not are not building um, a SQL front end, um, and so we've been we've been uh, working with uh, working with with DuckDB around uh, you know around that, and so it's quite likely that that if this what we have in C plus plus to the extent that we provide a SQL front end that, that it's very likely that will go through DuckDB. And so I'll discuss how, like, technically speaking, like how, how we will make that uh, connection happening so that we can also uh, pr preserve the, the loose coupling that, that we desire between these different software components. Um, of course, you know, building relational operators uh, is a lot of work. So we've been, we've been busy building things like um, you know, things like hash aggregations, hash joins, um, and the different operators that you would need to, uh, to implement, um, you know, the standard database benchmarks, TPCH, eventually TPCDS. Um, so we have near complete, uh, near complete support for TPCH and C++, whereas in Rust, um, there's been complete uh, TPCH, uh, TPCH coverage uh, in data fusion for quite a while. Um, we don't, uh, the, the Arrow community is not is not a monoculture. Mono There's not a central governing body that's deciding what is the roadmap for the project. So, in a sense, the Rust developers uh, are are acting, you know, are acting on their own, building um, systems that are top to bottom uh, Rust, you know, Rust native. And so, for example, uh, folks from from Influx Data working on the next generation execution engine for Influx DB. Have been contributing contributing heavily to um, to to data fusion because data fusion forms the core of um, their next generation IOX uh, uh, query engine. So they're moving from Go uh, from Go to Rust. Um, but uh, from like a development standpoint, there isn't a great deal of like day to day collaboration uh, between the C plus plus developers. It includes a lot of people on, on my team and the Rust developers, although we do work on things like integration testing so that we make sure that systems that are built in either of these languages can connect to each other. And we, and we've, you know, we've verified that, uh, we've verified that, that the protocols are compatible. Uh, so one so, very so, exciting, so, go ahead. So yeah. should, I, should, I, should I think of data fusion as like, that's an influx project that doesn't fall under the umbrella of Arrow? Is no, Arrow, they, is, no. Data fusions, uh, yeah, data fusions part of part of Apache Arrow. Um, it was started by um, by Andy Grove, um, who is now at a, he's now at Nvidia. Um, it's not part of his day job, but he um, he was at a working at a different company. Um, he donated data fusion to the Arrow project, and then um, organically um, influx uh, influx DB 
decided that they were going to build their next generation query engine in Rust moving from Go. Um, and then rather than build something from scratch, they said, you know, we want it to be based on Arrow. We want to take advantage of like all of the good things that Arrow gives us. Um, and this query engine is a good starting point. So they decided to um, collaborate and build together rather than building like something full stack that's in FluxDB only. So probably they made, they maybe made their development process more, more complex by like introducing a like dependency between Rust crates. Um, but at the same time, um, there's like developers from all these other companies working on data fusion. So, it, you know, I guess you have to you know, believe that in some cases, open source can, can make you more productive. But like, so this has been, there's like a, there's an execution kernel written in C++ and at the same time, there's a whole nother one being written in Rust that basically, uh, repeats the same features. Is that how should I think yeah. about this? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in every, in everything's modular. And so, you know, I think if it would be an awesome outcome, if, if data fusion, um, becomes like the main, um, analytics tool, the thing that powers um, analytics in Rust. And I, I see every reason like why it, you know, why it will be like A, that when people are doing analytics, like data frame pro type processing, right? Or SQL processing um, in any kind of Rust application that needs to do embedded query processing. Um, and they want me the memory safety and other like, you know, Rust developers really want everything to be written in Rust. Um, it's kind of like Julia in, the, in a sense. So if, uh, if, if analytics and Rust uh, becomes, you know, effectively arrow native from day one, um, that's not a bad, that's, that's not a bad thing. Um, but yeah, one, so, so one, one cool thing uh, that, that we've been working, uh, working closely with the, with the DuckDB folks on is, um, is, is building um, near, uh, it's a zero copy here. I would describe it as very nearly zero, very nearly zero copy. I know the DuckDB folks are on the line, so um, I, I mean, maybe maybe something you know. Anyway, it's neither here nor there. But um, one of the cool things that you know that we've achieved is um, is being able to run DuckDB atop um, either memory resident data sets or uh, dynamically generated like uh, streaming data sets. And so, uh, so on the arrow side, we've built like all of these different like ways to get access to data, um, whether it, it could be like make an RPC call to some server, which streams the data to you over gRPC. And so you could attach that stream of data that you're getting over gRPC to, to DuckDB and run SQL on it. Um, so we have all these different places where data can come from and we can compose with um, you know, high performance query engine like DuckDB uh, with effectively zero, effectively zero overhead. Um, so we've exposed uh, these capabilities in, in R and allowing the, um, the using the dplyr API. So you can have a data set that originates uh, from the arrow library. So for example, um, you know, you could have a data set that lives in S3 or, you know, in Parquet files or DuckDB also knows how to read Parquet files, but um, if there was some data that, that Arrow knew, knew how to read, but DuckDB didn't, you could grab a, 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 a kind of def, a um, streaming handle to that data and then pipe that into DuckDB and write your, write your query, which could be in SQL or it could be using this dplyr API um, and let, uh, and let, let DuckDB um, do its thing. Uh, similar API is possible um, in, in Python and we connect these um, connect these libraries together without sharing any code. And so I'll explain in, in the slides how that, how that connection takes place so that you can enable this, um, you know, zero copy data level composability without any code sharing. So very cool stuff. Um, so, so very, very quick words about the, uh, you know, about the arrow columnar format. It's principally uh, designed for, for runtime use. So you can put it on disk, but it isn't designed to be um, a storage format. Um, that being said, I, I, uh, I will express the perhaps controversial view that it's time to, um, it's time to design a better file format than, than Parquet. So one that is um, faster, a lot faster to decode and perhaps is designed with like more affinity 
uh, with Arrow in mind. Um, so having, I know a lot of people on this call, including myself, have uh, um, suffered a lot of blood, sweat, and tears dealing with, um, you know, uh, with, with, par with the Parquet format, um, but something that we should, we should think about. In the meantime, you know, Arrow is intended to be used as a companion technology to, um, to columnar storage formats like Parquet and RC. Um, so has support for flat and nested schemas, uh, data is arranged in, a, in the form in a format um, to facilitate uh, SIMD processing. Um, and one one feature that was important to a lot of us when we started the project was making sure that we can um, accommodate both um, scan and, and random access workloads. So rather than you know there are certainly data structures out there that are primarily um, used in a, in a scan con you know scan based context, but um, you know, we, so if you need to access a cell in the middle of a large arrow data structure, you can do that, um, you know, in, with a constant time guarantee. I see Dominic has his hand up. Yeah. Um, one question about, you, you mentioned that you, there was a lot of blood and sweat and tears in, in dealing with Parquet. Uh, what specifically, uh, is the issue with Parquet and how can Arrow as a, on this format solve that? Um, the, I mean, the, the, the decoding, um, the, the, the decoding of Parquet files is, um, is rel it's relatively complex. Um, so there's, there, there, there's several layers of, there's several layers of encoding in the file, um, that are designed to make the file as small as possible. And so this was kind of reflecting the reality on the ground in 2011 when, when the format was designed, which was that a lot of data processing workloads were bottlenecked on the performance and latency of spinning disk hard drives. And so going through um, you know, dictionary compression and then um, run length encoding of uh, you know, null and non-null data and then additional general purpose compression on top of data pages um, you know, combined with like, you know, like thrift and like kind of messy, you know, um, you know, the metadata is like, is, is rather complex. Um, so it, it's overall, like there, there've been, it, it's a little bit of a, um, it's a little bit of a Frankenstein, uh, file format and yeah, it's the, you know, it's effectively the best we've got that's in terms of widely adopted technology, it sparks preferred file format. Um, and so it's, uh, it's definitely not, it's definitely not going anywhere, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's pretty computationally, uh, pretty com you know, pretty computationally expensive to decode. So I don't know, like, I know I see Hannes is on the line. I know that like Hannes has suffered greatly. So if you have any like thoughts or comments about that. I'm assuming also too, that the, you have the same issues with iceberg and then the, the carbon data ones as well. Like there's, there's as you said, they're designed from 10 years ago. I think iceberg is iceberg is built on um, is built largely on parquet, so it's like a yeah. metadata and planning layer on top of parquet. It uses parquet files it's, itself to to store uh, the metadata, so to make like getting okay. doing reading the metadata for a large like you could have millions of files and getting the getting all the manifest of the data set in iceberg is involves reading a single parquet file. Is my understanding. Okay. I think the one's a formatting question for you. All right, so, so we'll go to Hamid in a second. Actually, Adam, do you want to say your comment quickly? Sorry, I was going to say the, the modern icebergs, the latest ones are um, file format agnostic now. Okay. All right, yeah. Hamid, question. Okay, so what is your prediction over here regarding some loss of compression? Because again, parquet format, if you have it in the storage format, uh, then it's going to eliminate a lot of Form reformatting of the data every time you do I/O, so we are willing to compromise on the compression a bit uh, to get that. So, what is your prediction? It's going to be ten percent worse in compression, or it's going to be like hundred percent or three x? I'm not. I'm not sure. To 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 be honest, um, yeah. I mean, but you know, considering that that overall. Uh, bandwidth to, you know, bandwidth to storage, you know, will continue to be, you know, continue to get faster and faster. 
Um, and I think that we will see more and more um, storage coprocessor support. Like if any of you've seen the, the work that um, is going on at um, uh, Carlos Maltzan's group uh, working on, on Ceph and uh, pushing down um, arrow processing into, into Ceph. Um, so I think we're gonna see kind of a, um, you know, it's almost like two steps, uh, you know, one step, uh, I don't know what the right metaphor is, but uh, you know we worked really hard to like completely decouple processing from storage. But um, you know I, I think that uh, uh, you know the the future will be some you know some hybrid of the two. So doing some amount of lightweight processing in the storage layer, and you know if you have 400 gigabit or 100 gigabit networking, um, you know actually moving the data to the node that needs to process it is uh, you know rel is not yeah the, the the you know rather than being io bound like it was in the past it would be more compute bound yeah so but the point over here is that in the modern system more and more we are really working on the data which is cached in the cluster then mm -hmm. and right. 100 gigabit they're all going to 400 gigabit so the io bottleneck is gone right and then we have to spend all this cpu time converting the format from one to the other Right. But compression is important because we're using expensive NVMEs and optane right. and all that stuff. Right. So compression is important. Right. Right. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I would hope that, um, and, and this is, you know, something that, that as an open source community, we should work on together to develop, um, you know, the, a, a compression scheme that is, that delivers, um, good compression ratios on on arrow data uh, that can be de decompressed a lot uh, a lot more quickly than um, you know a lot more quickly than parquet. And I don't know whether it's like the compression ratio might be, you know, if 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 on average the files are twice as big as parquet files, like perhaps that is as, that's an, an acceptable trade off. Like I, um, you know, I'm I I don't know that I'm the right judge of like what's an acceptable trade-off, but I would be interested to know like what, what is, what, what is an acceptable trade-off and every system may have, um, yeah, yeah may, may see things differently. So anyway, um, something we'd we'll love to talk more about this offline. So, um, feel free okay. to, yeah. This is something that we might be looking into. Let's, let's take this offline. Yep. Yep. Um, all right. So go through this quickly. Um, skip talking about arrow metadata. So we have data types, uh, metadata brings semantic meaning to the physical memory layouts. Um, uh, we have a number of built-in, uh, you know, built-in memory layouts, which have been relatively unchanged since the, since the beginning of the project. Um, I think one interesting area, um, I'm about to start a discussion um, on the arrow mailing list is incorporating um, new or augmented columnar layouts, uh, taking uh, into consideration, um, you know, innovations that have, have occurred in um, other uh, columnar processing systems. So for example, um, DuckDB, Velox, uh, and UmbraDB um, all use a common um, string view data type with inline uh, small strings, um, which has, you know, numerous benefits. Um, so I think that's something we should look at adding to to arrow more formally, um, as well as adding, uh, you know, run length encoding, constant arrays, um, and Velox is to, has some stuff uh, or that enables uh, reuse of, of data in nested uh, in, in nested types and rearranging data in a nested array without uh, doing any data copying. That um, can be pretty, you know, pretty beneficial in some in some workloads. And so, rather than having, you know, I worry about um, columnar systems specializing because they have performance needs and we end up with like you know more fragmentation at the data level than than would be desirable so so some things to um if you're interested be happy to have your feedback um so uh so i don't run out of time um so arrow has a, a binary protocol for interprocess communication it is streaming in nature so the schema is negotiated up front um, along with uh, dictionaries we allow dictionaries to be replaced or appended to uh, midstream. So you could, so if you have a dictionary that's evolving, you could send a delta um, after you've already sent a number of um, column batches uh, of data. 
And so on the receiver side, when a receiver uh, receives a payload of arrow data, they, they uh, can construct data structures that, that just have memory addresses to the, to the blob and binary blobs. And so that enables us to do um, uh, the, you know, much the, you know, the heralded, uh, you know, zero copy property. Um, we've, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we've been developing a um, kind of an out of the box RPC framework built on top of gRPC um, intended to make it easier to build arrow native data services where we've dealt with the particular details of taking our binary protocol and wetting it with um, data uh, streaming um, push and put streaming puts and gets um, using in, in gRPC. So we've done some low level optimizations in gRPC to avoid um, so the data is embedded in um, protocol buffers, but we, we've done some, you know, depending on who you ask, um, you know, you could either view them as hacks or, you know, elegant, uh, you know, elegant uh, intercepting of serialization to avoid um, unnecessary memory copies, but it works, uh, works fairly well. Uh, one thing we're looking at in flight uh, that may be of interest to this group is uh, developing um, alternative data transport layers. Um, so in particular, looking at things like LibFabric and UCX. Um, so flight performs really well on 10 and 10 and 40 gigabit Ethernet. Um, but if you were, um, you know, if you have 100 gigabit or 400 gigabit, um, you know, TCP is not, you're not, not going to be your best, your best friend there. Um, so, so we'd like to continue to use gRPC as the uh, control plane while having an alternative data plane for faster, uh, for faster uh, data movement. Um, so flight's designed for um, parallel, um, so parallel data access. So you could have, um, uh, you know, a get request, which uh, the data is sharded across multiple nodes. So rather than data coming through a single coordinator endpoint, when you make a query to a flight service, you get back um, a listing of endpoints to query. And so depending on the topology of the service, um, it might, all the data might come from one node or it could come from, you know, an arbitrary collection, uh, collection of, of nodes. So you might make one get request or 10 get requests, uh, depending on what the, how the service is arranged um, on the other side. Um, another, a thing that we've been doing in the last uh, year or so with flight is thinking about like, okay, we have, we have arrow we've got this nice columnar format. We have all these different systems that support it. Um, but what about, you know, slow, slow database protocols or slow database interfaces um, like ODBC and JDBC. So wouldn't it be nice if we could sidestep um, those middleware APIs? So having to marshal data into the ODBC API or the JDBC API and go direct to Arrow. And so we've called this effort uh, Flight SQL to define uh, middleware data structures uh, to enable um, exposing full ODBC-like semantics over uh, over the flight interface. So the data can come back, you execute a SQL query, you can pull the result, the result set uh, directly in arrow format and, and thereby you know, side, uh, provide an alternative to, to ODBC, for example, and database systems. So we're, um, you know, it's hard to do, these chicken and egg problems are hard because you know, we have to get, now we have to get, um, you know, see, see which um, database systems or database vendors might be first to implement, you know, flight SQL and hopefully we can start, we can start a new trend there. Um, another pretty new standard for connectivity, uh, which we've been using to great uh, uh, benefit and profit in DuckDB is the uh, C data interface. And so this enables two systems to exchange either a single um, blob of arrow data um, or a stream, an iterator of, of arrow data um, using uh, a set of simple um, C structs. Uh, so you can copy those C structs, put them in your, um, put them in your application, your system. Um, you have to write some code to like generate the, um, to populate the structs, but you aren't required to take on any library dependency. And so, <clears throat> so uh, both DuckDB um, and, uh, and, and Meta, uh, Facebook's new project, Velox, uh, both implement the C API, um, which enables them to, to uh, connect to um, in process 
to at, at uh, C function call sites with pretty low overhead. So <clears throat> these are what the structures look like. Um, there's a spec that describes like what needs to go in the format field, you know, how, how data types are encoded and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, if the, um, if you look, you, you can look at the, uh, the DuckDB uh, implementation and it's quite, it's quite compact and, and tidy. And so I think that will provide a good, a good reference point for others to, uh, to implement, implement this uh, in, in their systems um, so that, you know, we can see it used in, in a, a real database system um, as a, a, for connectivity. So we now have support, at least in the, um, in the libraries in the Arrow project, um, I think four different um, programming language libraries support, uh, support the protocol. So if you have an application uh, which uses any of those libraries, they can generate, read and write that C interface, and then they can tap into these different uh, either query engines or uh, things like if you want to just use our, the Gandiva expression compiler, LLVM expression compiler, um, you could drop that into your application um, and use it with, um, you know, with relatively, uh, you know, keeping the, the details of the compiler relatively encapsulated. So pretty interesting possibilities, possibilities there. Um, another problem that, that uh, we're, we're spending some energy on of late is the, the problem of um, programming interfaces to, uh, to, to query engines. So, um, you know, in, 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 in the past, um, you know, we'd see, um, you know, a lot of vertical integration between execution engines and the front end query interface, whether that's more of like a data frame like API or SQL, uh, SQL API. And so, there's all of these different, you know, middleware libraries which enable uh, different language interfaces to talk to different different computing computing engines. And so, in the same way that we've we've worked with Arrow to um, same way that we've worked with Arrow to develop um, a standard for data connectivity between these systems, um, we'd also like to provide a, a middleware kind of standard uh, for connecting. Uh, programming interfaces to query engines. Um, and so, as I said earlier, there's multiple um, Arrow native or Arrow compatible query engines that, um, that, that exist. Um, and we would like to enable users to use their preferred programming language or pre preferred programming interface to access them and not be as you know, aware of the, of the particular details of what's going on under the hood to enable better interchangeability uh, of engines, um, you know, such such as such as we can. So certain details like um, you know data, like data loading and DDL type type things, um, we may not be able to make completely go away. But at least the um, query part of specifying an operation to run, whether it's in SQL or something else, um, if we could have some measure of standardization and interchangeability, that would be really nice. Um, so there's a kind of a parallel effort, not within Apache Arrow, but it's a separate open source initiative called Substrate um, that you know we've been working with, and uh, you know the DuckDB folks have been uh, have been collaborating as well and working on an implementation. Um, so Jacques Nadeau, who I helped start, uh, was part one of the creators of uh, Arrow. Where I've worked closely with him for years, um, so he's been been working on and driving this. And so the idea is to have a um, portable language agnostic uh, logical query plan. So you could generate it by um, parsing a, you know, parsing a SQL query. So there's a um, calcite to substrate uh, converter, uh, I believe that Jacques has been working on. So that's one way to generate substrate, which is a set of protocol buffers. Um, but we're also working on building uh, integrations with um, like data frame APIs in languages like Python and R. Uh, so that we enable alternative non-SQL based uh, interfaces. And so if a system knows how to accept substrate and execute substrate queries, um, we sort of get the, you know, the whole problem of like what SQL dialect do we do, we do and, and do we have to carry around a SQL parser and analyzer uh, to be able to do anything. So um, substrate is another thing to implement, but it's lower level um, than, than SQL and is at the, the level of logical level of logical query plans. So we're going for this world of 
um, different APIs going through Substrate to talk to different different backends. Um, all right, I know I'm running uh, running low on time, so uh, and I know we want to have a little time for questions, but um, um, so there's a lot of work happening on query processing for for Arrow. Um, so there's an expanding network, and I think this slide is not comprehensive, but there's um, an, ex an expanding network of query engines that um, can speak Arrow in some capacity. So whether systems that are built um, as Arrow native, you know, from the ground up, which includes um, projects like like Dremio and Data Fusion, um, there's projects that um, support Arrow at um, at little to no overhead um, through the C interface. So that includes uh, DuckDB and Velox. And then there's other database systems, which and that, now I need to add, figure out all of the names that need to go into this box that, e that support either um, importing Arrow or exporting Arrow in some capacity. And so Arrow has been used, for example, in both Snowflake and BigQuery as a medium of getting data out um, and into client APIs at, at higher speeds. Um, because then on the client side, you only have one thing to convert to wherever it, uh, wherever else you need the data, whether it's something Arrow native or if you need the data in Pandas or something, there's already like a pre-built Arrow to Pandas converter. Um, and we have been doing work in um, in C++ to build, uh, to, to build um, modular reusable relational operators. So you can see this work uh, ongoing in the Arrow code base. Um, so it's, uh, um, so, so these are things like, uh, like aggregation, joins, sorts, projection, filter, you know, the building blocks of, uh, uh, building blocks for relational query engine. Um, we have a growing compendium of um, array functions, uh, which can be used for interpreted expression evaluation. Um, and the intent with all this is to provide a uh, batteries included uh, toolbox for building uh, for building data processing engines. So not only do we have kind of the lower level of the stack, like the scanning, like the data with the data set interfaces, like how to read parquet files, how to address large directories of parquet files in S3 and deal with like um, schema, um, schema normalization, that sort of thing. Um, but we're now kind of building the, the middle um, processing processing layer such that uh, if you want to build a system that um, that can read and write data sets um, and and do some amount of analytics on them uh, that we have all of that available out of the box in the in the arrow project so um, I have an example here of some doing some um, uh, running some queries using the C++ API, um, and but I don't think I have time to cover it. So I'll post the slides and you can take a look at it. And, um, but I just wanted to say that um, we've been very active about exposing um, query processing capabilities in, um, in, in R and um, in the near future in, in Python. So if you are an R user and familiar with dplyr, uh, you can write, um, Queries with dplyr and address data sets that exist in a variety of different um, storage schemes, whether file systems, so remote file systems, local file systems, different file formats. Uh, so you can compose a data set um, uh, as one step of the process and then query it uh, using the standard uh, dplyr API. Or you could, if you could, if you insert the two DuckDB function after one of these pipes, then it will delegate the query execution to DuckDB um, using, using a single command. So that's very nice. Um, stuff that's coming up in some coming up in the near future in the project. Um, you know, we are uh, we're continuing to do a lot of work on um, on the query execution side of things. Uh, in particular, we're uh, looking to bring the same level of uh, programmability and um, and uh, and query pro uh, sort of data frame like interfaces to Python. Um, that's going um, sort of in non SQL interfaces. That's going through the IBIS project, uh, which is another project that um, I started years ago at at uh, Cloudera and is um, 
has developed a, a life of its own in the intervening intervening six years. Um, I think we're going to look at some, uh, given that we have uh, an expression compiler, uh, we, we will look at some things like um, like uh, just in time uh, just in time compilation uh, of hot paths. Um, so rather than doing interpreted expression evaluation everywhere, um, that if you have the LLVM runtime uh, built and Gandiva available, um, that you can uh, turn it on and use it to compile expressions and cache them um, for, um, and I, we, we haven't deeply studied the performance differences and when it makes sense to, to use the, the Gandiva compiler, but that's something that uh, we'll need to do some research to, to determine. Um, uh, so, if, so folks on this call have never seen the IBIS project in Python. I mean, basically, it's like dplyr for Python, and so it's a uh, a, a single user interface that can talk to many different uh, database backends. So it has uh, existing SQL backends for uh, you know for Postgres and uh, um, you know ClickHouse and Impala. Um, BigQuery, like the you know Google Cloud people have been building and maintaining the BigQuery interface and using it for a bunch of uh, Google Cloud SDK stuff. Um, so it's a pretty nice tool and provides like a very clean uh, relational algebra API for for Python that has um, you know type full uh, kind of type validation, strong typing, um, and it will uh, you know bark at you if you. Uh, uh, build a, a, a relational algebra relational algebra expression that has some kind of um, uh, some kind of um, problem with it. Whether you're trying to apply a, an expression on a relation where that it can't you can't resolve um, can't resolve a field or uh, determine some other in, invalidness to to an expression that you've written. So. Um, so uh, yeah, how are we? Um, so on the business side, uh, how are we paying for all of this, all of this development work? Um, so for a number of years, I, I worked on um, Arrow in a nonprofit capacity. Um, so funded by funded by our studio um, for you know the interest in having um, Arrow powered analytics available in R and better connectivity with languages other than R. Um, supported uh, as well by by two sigma um, and, um, and and a lot of other a number of other sponsors so, so that was uh, uh, it was great um, we spun out of our studio to form Ursa computing in 2020 uh, and raised some uh, some money from from venture capitalists and earlier this year we we found a, an opportunity to join forces with uh, pioneers from the um, from the uh, GPU analytics uh, ecosystem, um, so, so Blazing SQL and, uh, and leadership from the Rapids uh, organization at NVIDIA um, who had built uh, Aero Native uh, computing for, for CUDA. Um, and so we are working to, to build a uh, unified computing foundation um, that is hardware optimized, Aero Native, um, and, uh, and works, uh, um, works well across um, across user programming languages. Um, the mission of uh, the open source uh, community uh, driven mission of Ursa Labs will continue on. So Ursa Labs is now Voltron Labs and we you know, are maintaining, maintaining a dedicated uh, open source team whose mission uh, is, is to uh, continue to grow and support uh, the development of the, um, the uh, Apache Arrow ecosystem kind of as we think of it now, like the the Arrow Cinematic Universe um, as the, the 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 project and its ecosystem continues to grow. So, uh, um, well, thanks for listening. Hopefully, there was some some interesting things here. I, I imagine there's some things that would be good for us to to dig into offline. So, if um, there's anything that's uh, thought provoking, um, be happy. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, on uh, you can send me a DM on Twitter. Um, I'm sure you can. Anyone on this call can can find my email address uh, easily from looking at GitHub. Um, and uh, and we also are are uh, are hiring. So uh, if you're interested in working on any of these problems, um, you know, happy to talk with you uh, about that as well. Okay, awesome, Wes. I will clap on behalf of everyone else. All right, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Uh, Raise your hand if you want, and we'll 
call on you and go for it. Or unmute, unmute yourself to fire away. Surprising. Okay. Um, all right. So I guess my my question is not so much a technical question because everything you laid out I think makes sense. Um, my question is like, you know, if your vision is successful and that arrow becomes the thing that you know, this is the protocol everyone speaks and they're they're using the different building blocks that you're you're developing that composed together will essentially makes a you know makes a data dispensary system or an, an analytical data dispensary system. Um, and if everyone's using all these different features, then what's the what's the future of database systems? Like what is the distinguishing characteristic or distinguishing feature that would make one system better than another? Like it's all arrow underneath the covers. Uh, is it just the UI is what's different? Or you're also obviously missing a query optimizer, which I don't think is something you, you want to uh, pursue. And so no. maybe people just use CalSight and so it's the cost model. Like, right. like is, is that the, like, is that how you see the future? Or do you still think there's different, like what would be something that someone could add if they built the entire system using Arrow's toolkit that is missing other than the optimizer and a UI? Yeah, I mean, we're we're aiming for I mean, we're, we're aiming for for composability and modularity. So, um, so things like the the SQL, like the SQL front end uh, query optimizer, um, you know, to the extent possible, like we would like those those things to be to be modular, you know, to be modular as well. Um, of, of course, the optimizer needs to needs a lot of information about the you know about the data itself and the characteristics of the query engine. Um, so, so that's you know it's easy to say like modular modular query optimizer great, um, but Calcite you know Calcite has done done a uh, you know a pretty good job of of providing providing that to applications. So, um, so I think that's a good model for what you know what success uh, what success may look like. Um, but but to your point about what, what's the distinguishing feature of um, you know. Of, of database systems, um, I mean, I think you know. Ultimately, from from the user standpoint, you want I mean, you want things to be simple in the sense that um, you can choose the choose the programming model that makes sense for you. Whether it's uh, working in more of a you know more of a data frame like interface, or or continuing to work on work with SQL, and everyone's always grumbling about you know how much they hate SQL. And um, there's really been no, you know, it's like, well, what's after what's after SQL? I'm sure we'll still be writing SQL in 30 years. Um, but if we create the environment where, um, you know, new query languages could be, you know, could be developed in a way that's like modular and interchangeable, um, that doesn't seem like that doesn't seem like such a bad thing. I, I think another, I mean, uh, I think another aspect is that by standardizing by by having more standardization at least on the protocol and like the interface between systems as as arrow that um, system builders can focus more on um, cost effectiveness so rather than like having these walled gardens where people like are using your system and they're kind of stuck and so it's like migrating to another system is comes at like a very high people cost that when processing engines are more modular um, if you could interchange or like upgrade, you know, upgrade, make upgrades at the processing processing engine level um, that reduces your computing costs in the same way. It's like, oh, I, you know, I buy a new, uh, I buy a new computer and, you know, my, my stuff runs faster. Um, so essentially, you know, to, to, to have some, some level of, of, you know, decoupling the user interface from the, you know, from the execution engine what's going on under the hood so that um, we get we get into this environment where the industry is more aligned on like, you know, rather than trying to like um, have a build walled gardens and like build a moat around your your walled garden that instead it's like, okay, well, how can we um, how can we reduce the carbon footprint of the amount of data that we're processing? Because um, that's like, it's, it's a huge problem. I think your comment about like, could the next sequel come out from this is actually 
very interesting. I, I don't think it I said I don't think it will. I, I don't think SQL is going anywhere. I, uh, yeah, I don't think so either. But but the idea when you think about it, everyone who's tried to replace SQL, it's always been attached with like the bespoke database system they built from it, built for it, right? So like the 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 object oriented databases in the late eighties, the XML guys, the the Mongos, everyone's trying to say, okay, here's my new language plus my new database system. But you just say, hey, I'm using Arrow's stuff, and I, I I can accelerate how quickly I can have a new database system. Then you can focus on the UI UX part, which could be you know a enhancements or replacement for SQL. I think that's actually very interesting. I have not thought about it in that, in that way. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Okay. Um, anybody else? Anybody else have any questions or comments? Anyways, um, Deepak. Uh, so hey. now that you're building operators in uh, Arrow, do you have any thoughts on testing them? Like how do you permute them and uh, ensure they're correct in different plans? Do you have any thoughts on building the test framework? Um, um. I haven't been doing a lot of person. I haven't personally been doing a lot of the development work on them lately, but um, I believe a lot of the a lot of the test cases are um, um, there. There's some some randomly generated tests as well as hand coded tests. I think I think it would be um, it would be good to move to um, you know more of a rather than having hand coded. I think if you look at you know DuckDB went through the same process of they. They had a for a long while. There was hand coded, hand coded C plus plus unit tests for correctness, um, and they've moved as far. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, almost entirely to uh, interpreted uh, interpreted uh, test cases. That makes it much easier to like generate, um, you know, generate and uh, and write like tons and tons of tests. Um, and so. I, I I think that we you know we, we will need to move in that direction. Um, we'll need to move in that direction as well, just to make it easier to 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 write write and generate lots of generate lots of tests. Um, and we can you know we've got I mean, we've got the DuckDB integration, so we we've got um, you know a, a system that is um, you know really rigorous and and uh, about correctness that we can uh, use as a, a as a as a check. Thank you. Hey, Dominic here. Um, you mentioned that in Voltron, you're also focusing on GPU support. What's the story for uh, Arrow and GPUs? Um, well, I, I, you're familiar with uh, you're familiar with with uh, with Rapids and uh, and QDF, which is um, which is built uh, which is built on Arrow. Um, there's there's a couple of minor deviations from Arrow that are. For example, um, booleans are not are not bit packed um, on GPUs um, because it, you know it makes sense to blow them up to bytes, you know, for mm. for, for GPU reasons. Um, but but by and large, like it the um, you know we we consider it a you know we consider it an arrow based you know an arrow based system, um, and um, you know we're interested in in uh, in uh, in seeing. In uh, in seeing you know uh, robust you know robust GPU support for for Arrow um, you know into the you know in, into the future um, so kind of the you know the form factor um, you know the, the form factor for delivering that the programming API kind of the you know the, the kind of packaging and configuration of libraries and tools like if you use um, you know if you use um, uh, QDF, like QDF, QDF has its own uh, Python, you know, Python library and uh, set of set of pandas like set of pandas like APIs. And so I think we would be interested in bringing, uh, you know, bringing that under a, a common programming interface. So like if you look at the, you know, the, the IBIS, uh, you know, programming model or the dplyr programming model so that you can, you know, sort of switch between like, like, okay, I've got, I've got, I can, you know, send this query over to ClickHouse over here or to, I can run it embedded on DuckDB here. And you're not having to rewrite, you're not having to rewrite your code, um, you know, based on you know, where the query is running and like what query engine is running it. I look forward to the day when we can do that with browsers. Uh, we can just yeah. memory map with browsers. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can, uh, well, you can, you know, uh, 
I mean, you've got you've got DuckDB compiled to to Wasm and running in in browser and reading Parquet files. So you know we're um, you know we're we're basically already there. Um, mm. I, th I think there's like uh, you know kind of some ecosystem. Um, you know, the ecosystem has to become more mature and things have to become like, you know, just more, uh, you know, of just uh, people, it's just something we can, you can rely on in, in the browser um, and, not, and uh, have available ubiquitously. But, you know, wouldn't it be cool if, um, you know, Chrome shipped with a, uh, Chrome shipped with a query engine built in and um, yeah, and say, oh, there's a CSV file here. Okay, like I'm gonna, let me run some SQL on that and you don't have to think about it. I think that would be nice. Yeah, what I'm thinking is if we could memory map directly from, let's say, an R process to... Oh, I see. Yeah. So they can then visualize the data there uh, so that if I'm in Jupyter, for instance, I don't even have to copy data uh, into the browser. I just like directly reference. It. I see. That would be cool. But I guess there's some, some like... like, there's some like <laughs> yeah, that sounds like, that sounds like some, enough to give a, like a Chrome security dev, like an aneurysm, but I'm sure we yeah. could we could figure something out. Okay, uh, my last question is before we go, it, it, if quickly, is there anything that you found that people, how people have used Arrow in a way that you found to be surprising or unexpected? Um, or no, because this database people and everyone is really safe at this point. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, um, I think I think I think one thing that I I I didn't know what to expect, but I, I it wasn't it wasn't obvious to me that that people would build like bespoke um, like storage systems using like using Arrow directly, and mm -hmm. so so Arrow has been adopted in in like um, if anyone's familiar with Hugging Face, it's like a like an ML like an ML framework, um, and so so people have been building like proper like storage and like and storage systems um based you know based on arrow and so so there's no reason like there's no reason not you know no reason not to do that um mm -hmm. but uh yeah we you know certainly it's it's not like um it's it's somewhat off off label use like we aren't encouraging people to start archiving data in, in arrow format and then storing it in in s3 buckets yes.